Understanding Post-Transplant Organ Rejection. Well, hey, folks, my name is Jim Merle. I appreciate you once again being with me today on the Transplant Helper Podcast slash YouTube video series. Today, we're going to be discussing the topic of understanding post-transplant organ rejection. Now, certainly the word rejection is something that brings fear into all the hearts of us who are transplant patients and and something that we want to avoid if at all possible. So today, I just want to help to give you an understanding and an awareness of what rejection is and perhaps if there's a way to avoid it or at least keep it at bay, some things that we can do to help ourselves to fight off and to avoid rejection. So let's just jump right into our discussion. And let's talk about rejection a little bit today. Now, first of all, when we talk about the classes of rejection, there are three major classes of rejection, the way the doctors see things. And they're going to talk about these sometimes in front of you. So maybe these terms will help you out just a little bit. Number one, there's what they would term as acute rejection. Now, acute rejection is a rejection that's kind of a sudden onset. Typically, it's something that takes place between the first week and three months after transplant, although it can take place at any point post-transplant, but typically the first week to to three months after transplant. And acute rejection is is usually very, very small in nature. It's usually not something that's too severe, uh, albeit it can be of various levels that we're going to discuss in just a moment, but it's oftentimes and most time treatable. Now, when acute rejection onsets, what they're really trying to do at that point It's just to stop the rejection quickly enough with medications and other ways to keep it from causing any long-term damage. You don't want that heart, those lungs, that kidney, liver, whatever it is, to be damaged by this rejection. And so they're going to work very quickly and act very quickly to try to stop acute rejection. So uh, let me just let you know that 80% of transplant patients will face some form of acute rejection inside of the first three years. So if you hear the word rejection, Rejection, especially if they say you have acute rejection, don't panic. Don't think that your life is over. Most likely it's going to be treatable. You just need to stop and do whatever the doctors say. And, and we'll talk about the levels of that type of rejection in just a moment. But acute rejection is one type of rejection you may hear about and you may even face. Number two, they may talk about sometimes chronic rejection. Now, chronic rejection is kind of a rejection that's caused by acute rejection, but it's gone on and on over a longer period of time. And chronic rejection, as it might sound, is something that takes place sometimes to us a little bit farther out of transplant. Maybe It's just left from the residual damage done by the acute rejection over time. And typically chronic rejection um, has to do with some of the thickening around the graft sites. And they they say graft site. Now, graft is is the organ itself. But where the connections go together for that organ, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidney, whatever, where they've connected that, there's a thickening where there's some damage that's been done at those connection sites. And so there's chronic rejection. Now, chronic rejection is where they begin to first see the first signs of maybe that new organ failing a little bit. And and so again, don't be deathly afraid of this. Don't think your life is over. But if you hear the term chronic rejection, understand that it's going to have to be treated a little bit differently, not maybe just as aggressively, but it may take a lot longer to get over chronic rejection. Acute rejection may be turned around in a matter of a week or so. Chronic rejection may be that you go for treatments over a longer period of time to try to not only stop that rejection, but also to correct some damage that's been done by the rejection. So you have acute rejection and chronic rejection, but then you also have what's called hyperacute rejection. Now, again, I don't want you to be afraid, but if you hear the term hyperacute rejection, that's not good. Hyperacute rejection is what the doctors speak of when they're talking about a rejection that's kind of a sudden onset, but it's doing damage right now. And what they mean by that is that organ is in very grave danger. Um, Basically, one of the better treatments for that is to go into that graft, that heart, that lung, whatever, to go in and start removing tissue. And you know that's not good, but they're probably not going to be able to treat hyperacute rejection simply with medication. They're going to have to go in and do something surgically more times than not to reverse hyperacute rejection. But again, 
Whatever they need to do, you want to cooperate with that because hyperacute rejection is the type of rejection that you might hear about sometimes, unfortunately, that takes people's lives very quickly. So just be ready for that and be looking out for the signs and symptoms of rejection, which are hard to detect because sometimes those signs and symptoms are kind of cold-like, flu-like, uh, fevers. And then sometimes there are just simply no symptoms. So going to regular doctor visits, taking your medication, all those things are good for preventing rejection. So that's the classes of rejection, acute, chronic, and hyperacute. Now, what about the categories of rejection? Because acute rejection, which is the most common type, uh, falls into several different categories as found by the international uh, whatever it is group for heart and lung transplants and so i'll give you those they go from r0 up to r3 now you may have heard me mention those before but from r0 up to r3 there are several types of rejection that can take place now r0 is obvious that means there's no rejection found they've gone into the blood work they've done biopsies or sometimes even mris can detect that although not likely but it's possible but they've gone in and they've looked at this organ or they've biopsied this organ or taken the blood work or a combination of all and they found no signs of rejection and that, that's wonderful and by the way i've been in r0 for the last four years i've never met with rejection i'm very very blessed in that i'm thankful for that and, and if i meet with rejection i'll just have to take my own advice on the preceding point but r0 is where you want to be now r1 rejection is of course a slight rejection and if you hear the word rejection and they say r1 just take a deep breath and understand most likely all they're going to do is sit down and review your medications with you. Uh, be sure that you're taking them properly, that you're not missing dosages, that you're um, taking the right kinds of medications at the right times. And then they're going to change that just a bit. Most likely your prographs or your steroids or a few other things, depending on what type of organ you, you had transplanted. They're going to adjust the medications a little bit. And in a week or two, you're probably going to be fine. Now, they may want to repeat some of those biopsies and blood work. And again, that's fine. You're going to be okay, though. That's an R1 rejection. Now, R2 rejection, as you may assume, is a little bit more severe. Typically speaking, with R2 rejection, the doctors are going to want to hospitalize you for that. And, and they're going to do the, kind of the same protocol as an R1 but they're most likely going to put you in the hospital because they're going to want to give you your meds via IV or via some sort of essential line to make sure that you're getting those medicines not only accurately but quickly. Um, it's going to be a little bit more severe. They're going to want to monitor you very closely. But by doing that, they can change things quickly. You know, uh, some of your medications, for example, that you take on 12-hour increments where you take a couple of pills here and then 12 hours later you take two more, uh, that's not going to be uh, good enough because in the hospital they can give you the medicine on a continual drip and, and monitor your blood work and such, maybe bops you every day or so in that case and just see if changes are being made quickly enough and they're going to take care of you again. That's for R2 rejection, most likely going to be hospitalized. Now, R3 rejection, R3 acute rejection is the most severe form of acute rejection that you can be in. And this is a dangerous situation. I'm not going to hide that from you. It's a dangerous situation, but please don't panic. Just let them handle things. Again, same treatment as before. You're going to be in the hospital, going to be on IV medications. They're just going to be very, very aggressive in this one. Um, they're going to be doing everything they can to prevent you from going from acute R3 into hyperacute rejection. And it's the safest place to be in the hospital. And if for any reason, um, you know, you think for a moment that they're not doing what they need to do, you need to really, really work with them. Tell them how you feel. It's very important if you're in the hospital for R3 rejection that you communicate not only, um, you know, just every sign, every symptom, you know, that you can that you can get across to them because they're only able to see what they can see in the test. And you need to let them know, I'm feeling pain in this area. I, I'm having a fever here. Maybe that's not detectable yet. You know, whatever. Just work very close with them. Cooperate, as in all cases. Be compliant, and you'll be fine. So that's the categories. We have the classes, and then we have the categories of acute rejection from R0 to R3. Now, what about the causes? Well, let me first of all tell you, there most a lot of rejection, not most, but a lot of rejection is what I would call non-preventable. What I mean by non-preventable is 
there's nothing you can do about it. Organ rejection is, is going to happen sometimes. That These organs are foreign to your body. Your body's going to try to reject organs. There's nothing you can do. So, so don't be frustrated. Don't be you know, disgusted if you go into some form of rejection like the ones we listed above. It's, it's just going to happen, and there's nothing you can do. The match that was given to you at time of transplant, you, you were not in control of that. As a matter of fact, for the most part, the doctors weren't even in control of that. You know, the National Organ Association was trying to match those organs, and they did the best they could based upon your need. You might have been very, very, very acutely sick at the time, and you had to get the first organ available that remotely matched. And so you may deal with more rejection again in my case uh, i got a very very exceptional match uh extremely exceptional match and i've just not dealt with much but it's non-preventable so so don't let that discourage you but let me say this more than 50 percent this is what's kind of sad 50 percent of organ rejection is preventable because it's caused by medication mishaps and I mean, people taking the wrong medication at the wrong time or the wrong dosages or, or for that matter, just being noncompliant and not taking their medication to begin with. 50% of organs that are failing are failing because people are not taking their medication properly. That's why I'm such an advocate of teaching medication management. That's why I push the, the importance of taking medication because, as I've said before in other videos, and constantly will, the danger you put yourself in, if you skip a dose of medication altogether, you are in danger of going into some, so, some form of acute rejection within 24 to 48 hours sometimes by missing that dose. So don't miss your medicine. Uh, use everything that you can at your disposal to make sure you take your medicine. That's the causes. Now, there may be some others, but mainly there's preventable or non-preventable and preventable. And you take care of the preventable. And you let God take care of the non-preventable. That's all we can do. Now, what about the cures? Well, there's really no cure, per se, for rejection. But there's certainly treatment. Um, the uh, treatments that they give you in the hospital through the, those anti-rejection meds, which are typically are a lot of the same that you already take, but the IV meds that they can give you, those things are, are just wonderful. I mean, I've seen people be in major R3 acute rejection, and, and you just, for lack of better terms, you just think it's over. There's nothing can be done. And a week later, they walk out of the hospital as if nothing had ever happened. So uh, understand they have great treatments. And if things get bad enough, if you end up in hyper-acute rejection and their only choice is to remove the graft, then they're going to do the best they can to retransplant you. So there's the treatments, but then there's a the transplant. And, and if you're like I am, I, I, I've dealt with this heart transplant. It, on one side of me, I don't want to ever do that again. But on the other side, if I can continue to extend my life, depending on the time and the age and, and a lot of factors, but I, I'm up right now for another transplant. If, if need be, I'm willing because it's been that good it, it's it's helped my life that much and it means that much and so you know rejection is a word yes it brings fear to our hearts but rejection can be understood so the classes of rejection yes acute chronic and hyper acute the categories are zero up into r3 the causes non-preventable you can't control but the preventable take your meds and then the cures they can either treat you in the hospital with the medications or your meds at home or they can retransplant you and again i know the last one there not what you want to hear but that's the facts of life so i hope this video has encouraged you if it has how about like the video subscribe to my channel share this with friends or whatever uh, I'm just out trying to help. I'm the transplant helper, and I want to help people who've had transplants. And hopefully today's video and all the others that I have available can do that. So just find my playlist and, and watch all the videos, but subscribe to this channel, and you'll be notified every time a video comes out. But until next time, stay stronger, friends.